Hey, this morning, uh, our scripture reading is from the Old Testament. Uh, it's from 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 18. And um, this is a really important scripture. Not that all scripture is not really important. Um, but this is a scripture that we don't typically hear um, a lot about. And there's a couple things going on here. One, pay close attention. Samuel is a boy that is called by God, and he is 14 years old. Eli is the high priest, uh, the highest priest that there is at the time. He's been ruling for 40 years, and Eli's sons, who you're going to hear were blaspheming, um, Eli's sons are uh, the priests also of the time. So you've got the high priest Eli, his sons, and a whole bunch of other priests, and then you have Samuel, who is Eli's son. This scripture, uh, there's a couple things that happen here. One, we hear through this scripture, one of the few sentences that we hear about Jesus Christ in the Bible. They refer to Samuel. Uh, Samuel is also remembered uh, in the same light as Moses. And, yeah, and Samuel is also foreshadowing Jesus Christ. So it kind of makes you wonder why we don't hear more about this scripture. Adriana is going to bless us with this reading. So please listen as we hear the word of God. All right, I'm reading Samuel. First of Samuel 3, 1 through 18. It's also on the screens. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At the time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was laying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was laying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lay down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called him again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. My son lay down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose. And went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. And the Lord came and, speak and stood, calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel, at which the two ears of everyone who hears will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli and all I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever." Samuel lay until the morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also if you hide anything from me of all he has told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord, so let him do what seems good to him. This is the word of God.
can be very tough in life as we've seen. I mean, life in this 21st century world can be extremely tough. In fact, what's been happening over the summer, whether you're here in South Florida or someplace else in the United States or, or around the world, especially our, uh, our expatriates that are watching and a lot of the military people, it's been a really kind of difficult summer for many of us. But hey, good news, if you're a parent, your kids are going back to school either tomorrow or the next day. So you're, many of you I know are on a road trip right now go, going, we got to get home and do wash so we can get out. But life can be tough. The good news is, in Christ, we can be brave. And speaking of being brave, uh, for many of you, you were here maybe for our beach baptism a, a couple weeks ago. And if you uh, take a look up on the screens, and it's coming up on your screen at home, um, I put some pictures of our beach baptism. We had 50 plus people out on the beach, plus all of uh, the people that came to observe there. And if you just look at some of these faces up there on the screen, we baptized 19 people. And this is really the heart of worship. I mean, it is a fundamental component of our faith. Uh, you may recognize some of those people, and I mean, just look at the, the, the faces as, they, as they're being baptized or as they come up out of the water, and that in the, in the center picture is us all praying together. In fact, that's part of the Great Commission. That's one of the things that, that Jesus calls us to in Matthew 28. In fact, the Great Commission reads, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. We're all unique. And God has called us all on, on unique journeys. And some of our, our journey for us to go out there and, and follow the great commandment is just to smile at someone. It's just to give them a smile. And that's how you express your Christianity. You're that, you're that welcoming, warm soul that someone sees in a crowd and goes, wow, for some reason that just gives me a warm fuzzy. Others are, are preachers and teachers and, and others just... Through your life, people see Jesus, but we are called to do different things with our lives, different things with our Christian journey, but we also have this common call to bring people to Christ. And today in this week, uh, in our small groups, in wine study and Bible tasting, and in our, our The Chosen small group, I'm going to share with you the one matter you must get straight before you can really start your Christian journey. And God has called you to do this. The salvation of others you encounter depends upon this. In fact, your very salvation depends upon it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this worship service. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts is pleasing to you, O oh Father, our rock and our Redeemer. We pray that all of your messages here are experienced by everyone, whether spoken or unspoken. And we lift this up in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's children say, Amen. I want to tell you about, um, if, if, uh, if you've heard me share, um, some people are daring enough to call me an extreme athlete. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I would go that far. I would say it may be extremely dangerous in some, in some cases. But I like to do lots of different water sports and actually lots of different sports. And one of the sports that I took up not too long ago was kiteboarding. And if you're familiar with kiteboarding, kiteboarding is when we fly this kite. It's actually a, a giant wing. We fly this giant kite above us, right? And we're kind of attached to this kite by all these things. We have a bar right here and we have a, a board on our feet and it pulls you out into the water. And as opposed to having a, a boat pulling you, you have this kite pulling you. And the cool thing is, if you get it to fly high, you can jump and you can do all these kind of fun stuff and land. I can't do that yet. But for some reason, I had to take this up several years ago because some of my friends were doing it. 
And actually, some of my friends are, are one of them is, is one of the founders of the sports. His name is Neil. Hi, Neil, if you're watching. And I have to tell you, when I initially walked out to the beach to get into this, um, I was fearful. I mean, I looked at it and I was like, okay, so I'm going to put that little board on my feet and that giant kite is going to pull me out into the middle of the ocean and then I'm supposed to get back here and there's waves and there's sharks and there's all sorts of things out there. Man, I don't, I don't know how I can do this. But eventually, after I got dragged down the beach and stood up with the bloody knees and, the, and kind of, you know, the, the burn that you get from bumping across the sand, I learned how to kiteboard. Not well, but I learned how to kiteboard. And eventually, I, I actually grew to love kiteboarding. In fact, if you ask me about kiteboarding, I will tell you, for me, it is a relaxing adventure. I became fearless. What about you? What's your biggest fear, Tom? What's your biggest fear, Landon? What is your biggest fear? I'm not going to call everybody out here, but what's your biggest fear online? Is it, is it a sport? Is it a person? Ah, is it your mother-in-law? <laughs> My mother-in-law doesn't watch. Is it your financial situation? Is it, is it a societal movement? Is it politics? Is it war? What is your biggest fear? Is it a relationship? What do all of us have to get straight before we can live the life that God calls us to live? Some big questions that should resonate with you. Well, today we saw that God calls Samuel in 1 Samuel 3. And Samuel's actually a teenage boy. He's 14 years old. And guess what happened to Samuel? He changed the world. In fact, I could say confidently that you are here today because of Samuel. In fact, you might not even be alive today if it were not for Samuel in the Old Testament. And 1 Samuel is, is what we deem a, a bookend chapter. And so 1 Samuel, the first verse and the last verse talk about the word of God. That's why we call it a book and chapter. It starts with God's word being rare in those days. And then it finishes with God's word being regular throughout the land. So how does this happen? And right in the middle of there, you've got a 14-year-old kid. And this changes how God interacts with his people. I mean, God calls Samuel. And when Samuel answers, he changes the world. And God's call and God's conversation with his people becomes regular. So if we start with 1 Samuel 3, it says, direct your attention to the screens. Now the boy Samuel continued to, I'm sorry, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. Remember, Eli is the big priest of the time. He is the highest priest of the time. He's been ruling Israel for 40 years. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Okay, so here's a big question. Why would the word of the Lord be rare in those days? Bigger question, why would God stop talking to you? Why would God stop talking to his people? God in the Old Testament, as you'll remember, spoke through prophets and he spoke through visions, right? We're Old Testament, Jesus comes in the New Testament. And God all of a sudden stops talking to his, his people. It's, it's rare, well, I have some ideas about that. Let's see, uh, reason one, that God would stop talking to his people. Well, the book of Judges clues us off on these. In fact, it says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Oh. So everyone's just living for themselves. People are starting to say, we don't need God in school. 
We don't need God in our society. We don't need God. It's all about me. We will just live for me. I mean, this is kind of like us today. God didn't create a whole bunch of robots. He created you with free will. And so people are living for themselves. They make all these decisions. And so God goes, nice, you make your bed. Then, and he allows a famine, and he stops speaking. This is a sign of God's judgment. People prefer darkness, it's all about me, rather than light. People pursue, prefer to pursue their own agendas and not God's. Why else would God stop talking to his people? Reason two, imagine this. The clergy in those days, the priests in those days, were abusing their authority. Wow, they're rich and they're powerful. And guess what they're doing? They're abusing women. Eh, I can't imagine how that would happen. And guess what? They're also stealing from God. Sound familiar? In 1 Samuel 2, it says that the priest proclaiming the word did not know the Lord. It calls the son of Eli, the high priest, his sons were the priests. The sons of Eli were worthless men. Huh, clergy today and clergy then. And let me warn you, be careful whose advice you listen to. Be careful what churches you attend. Just because someone puts on a really cool clerical collar or a really big robe does not necessarily mean that they are reconciled with the heart of God. I mean, imagine this. This is what happens back then. So you're a family. Your whole family's sitting down for dinner. You've been given the law from Moses, right? Moses gets, gets the law from God, and he says, here's the law. And you say, great, our family's going to follow the law. And all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door, and Eli's sons, the priests, they look fancy now. They show up at your door. And they decide they're going to take the food off of your table. In fact, the, the Old Testament says that the priest can come to your house and, and you may offer them the breast and the right leg of the piece of meat. And then the rest of that, your family gets to eat and certain parts of the meat is sacrificed to God. It belongs to God, the fat. But the priests walk in your house, and not only do they say, ooh, that looks delicious, and they take the breast, and they take the right leg, and they say, hey, all this stuff for God right here, we're going to take that with us too. You guys can have the leftovers. Try to teach your kids to obey God when that's happening from priests. I mean, no wonder God's speaking to his people rarely. And also, and the priest and Eli's son turned God's house, imagine this, into a brothel. When Moses got the law from God on Mount Sinai, he didn't get this law. Even Eli tries to correct them, and he says, hey, guys, you, you can't really turn the house of God into a brothel, and why is it that you are abusing women like this? But they refused to listen to their father. So Israel back then, Old Testament, before God, before Jesus Christ comes, is suffering under this arrogant, cynical, immoral priesthood. Clergy are stealing from God. Clergy are abusing women. I mean, if you were God, would you want these guys representing you to your people? Good news, God's got a plan. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 26, it says, Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Who else do we hear this very same sentence about? Let me give you a clue. Whenever you're in church and the pastor asks you a question, the answer is Jesus! Jesus! 
<laughs> you'll, you'll almost always get it right. The Bible says the same thing about Jesus Christ thousands of years later. Are you trying to serve God? Are you trying to be a good Christian in our society today, but you see this condemnation and people turning their backs on God? Good news, God is working it out behind the scenes. You see, God did something because he knew this was going to be happening. And many of us will sit back and say, hey, why does God allow hunger and why does he allow famine and why does he allow these, all these people to steal and all this political mess and all this stuff? Why does he allow this? He did something about it. He created you. He created you. So what's the one thing that we absolutely have to remember to ensure your salvation and to ensure the salvation of everyone who God has put in your life? We're going to get there. Keep listening. So what is the setting right here for God's call? We're in this Old Testament. It's night. Or it's during the early morning hours in the temple. And we know this based on the, the lampstand. And guess what's happening? Eli, the son, here we go, Indiana Jones type stuff, but it's biblical, is sleeping close to screens. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. That's where the Ten Commandments were kept. He's sleeping in this small room close to the temple, close to where the Ark of the Covenant is, and it is dark. And in verse 1, it says the word, or, or in this verse, the word call, when we read this story, is used 11 times in this paragraph. Right? The main point is, is God keeps calling Eli. He's going, Eli, or I'm sorry, he keeps calling Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. He keeps calling him 11 times. And Samuel runs to his father, Eli, and this happens over and over and over again. And finally, Eli says to his son, he keeps waking him up, he says, look, the next time God calls you, say to God, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And it says, now the Lord came and he, and he stood and he calls Samuel two times. Pause. Numbers are important in the Bible. We also see this in Scripture because God calls Moses two times and he calls Abraham two times. So what's the matter? We have to get straight. We must not fear. We must not fear what others think of us. We must not feel, fear what others call us. We must not fear what others tell us to do. We must not fear what society looks at us as Christians. We must not let that fear prevent us from proclaiming God's word. So God gives an assignment. He says to Samuel, Eli's son, and remember Eli is the high priest. He's basically Samuel's father. He is the judge of Israel for 40 years. This is the highest of, of high of clergy, right? He says in 1 Samuel 3 verses 11 through 14 on the screens, it says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which two, the two ears of everyone who hears will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli, he's telling this to his son, all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end, and I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever. God is about to take it down. Imagine your son comes to you and tells you that. For the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, 
They're abusing and stealing from God. And he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. God's saying there is nothing he can do. I'm about to take him out and go and tell your father that. Get ready. He's going down. And later we see this come true. Eli honors his sons, his priests, more than God. He could have removed them from the priesthood. He could have said, stop abusing women. Stop stealing from God. Stop being the, the high and mighty, but he doesn't. He lets them keep going on. And so what happens is the Philistines come in. They win the battle. They capture the Ark of the Covenant. And the Lord and his, and everything that the Lord has provided them, and Eli's sons, the priests, are killed. And when Eli learns of this, he falls over and he dies. Boom, the prophecy comes true. So I told you there's one thing you absolutely have to get straight before you can move through your life as a Christian. And here it is. Fear not. The Lord is with you. The world and the, and the devil will attack your life at, at specific points. But our, our loyalty, as Martin Luther states, he says, where the battle rages, there the loyalty, your loyalty, is proven. How do you react in those desperate times? Who do you become? You see, you can't just select God for pieces of your life and go, well, you know what? The Bible's good here and the Bible's good there. I like that stuff. That gives me the warm fuzzy. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But then the other pieces of the Bible that make me feel kind of uncomfortable, not so much. I'm just not going to read that stuff. I'm just not going to pay attention. I'm just not going to be that Christian in those circumstances where I don't have to be. You must commit to God and allow God to equip you. Why, why don't we hear about hell in church? You hear about it here. Why don't we hear about divorce in church? You hear about it here. You see, a lot of churches, if they talk about heaven and hell, the people that write the big fat checks don't like it. And so they decide not to talk about that. But that is not biblical. That is fear of Scripture. we got to be fearless. You must commit to God all the way in. You must commit to the Bible, not just to pieces of it. I mean, are we afraid? So Samuel, I love it. He goes and he tells his father everything. Right? I mean, can you imagine what this was like? Uh, Dad, excuse me, high priest. Um, I was just in there with the Ark of the Covenant, and God has a couple things he wanted me to mention to you. Uh, you an army is going to come in, invade, kill everybody, kill your sons, and you're going to die. Uh, look at the time. I mean, like, how, what was, what was that interaction like? I mean, God takes this teenage boy, he has him proclaim his word, and then in 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 21, God blesses Samuel, and, he, and God's word is no longer rare. God starts talking to his people again. And Israel is changed from this group of tribes ruled by judges to a nation ruled by a king. And guess what Samuel eventually does? He anoints a guy named King David. Have you heard of him? You know, the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Now look, Samuel was the, the most unlikely, 
ill-equipped teenage kid. In fact, when you read about the history of Samuel, he wasn't even supposed to be born. It says that, that uh, the Lord had closed his mother's womb and then decided to bless his mom with a child. And he was 14. And he's going to tell the high priest and the nation, I mean, maybe we should send this kid to the White House. And the word of God is no longer rare. God starts speaking. And now all of Israel knows, and they say from Dan to Bathsheba, which is like saying from New York to L.A., and there ain't no internet back then, that God is now speaking to his people. He starts communicating with his prophets with, with, through visions. And God doesn't call the equipped. Samuel was not equipped. God equips the called. And that's you. Even if you feel like, I can't do this, Lord, find somebody else. Moses said the same thing. Samuel acts as a faithful judge and prophet and priest. And guess what he foreshadows? Jesus Christ, as a king, a prophet, and a priest. And the chapter ends, and now the word of the Lord is across all of Israel, and, and Samuel is now compared with Moses. He's foreshadowed Jesus Christ. I mean, the Bible says, I sin against God if I fail to pray for you. Even if I don't like you, I pray for you. And I close with this. There's one matter you absolutely must get straight before you begin your Christian journey. Be fearless. Be fearless. And that may be just through your smile. Why do you smile so much? I'm a Christian. Be fearless communication, communicators of, of God's word, even if you communicate it with a whisper. Fearless communicators that fear nothing, nothing, but God himself. You see, there's a hunger inside of us that, that, we, are, that we are born with. There's a, there's a hole right here in your heart that all of us are born with. And you know these people that have it all? They have the money, the fame, the fortune, the business card with the CEO on it, the kids, they, they got it all. And you look at them and you go, whoa. And then if you know them well enough, they go, well, but there's something missing. Let me just get another Ferrari. That'll probably fill that hole. It ain't going to fill the hole. There is a hunger in you that can only be satisfied with Jesus Christ. Period. No amount of cash or sex or any other substance is going to fill that hole. A preacher named John Wesley called us all preachers. Every Christian is a preacher. Like I say, it might be through your smile, it might be through a whisper. And he said, give me 100 preachers, and that means you online. And all of us here, give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and they alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. God is working through your life. Teach it. Preach it. Communicated however he has blessed you with. Read it and be fearless because God's word unleashed 
will transform the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your call on our lives to proclaim your word and your love through our Christian lives. We recognize that we live in this world that can move our focus from love to lust, from compassion to indifference. It seems that when we're in the heat of things, the fire gets hotter and our society turns up the stress and, and the pain and it, and it just all comes at us at the same time. Lord, we ask that you grant us your peace and your grace in those times, dear Father. Empower us to proclaim your word through our lives. Lord, we've learned through the life of Samuel and our own lives that you do not necessarily call the equipped. Rather, you equipped the called. Father, call me and equip me. We are called as Florida Faith Church. You've also called me as an individual, as your disciple. Equip me so that I may fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but you. For we know that your word unleashed will transform the world. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's children say, Amen. Thank you.